Double Think, Newspeak, The Fort Police, Big Brother. Few novels have added so much to the modern English language and shaped the way we think about authority than George Orwell's 1984. In his excellent book, A Hundred Best Sci-Fi Novels, David Pringle describes the book as the vital link between the scientific romances of H.G. Wells and the emerging golden age of science fiction. Yet this novel might not be nearly so well known if it wasn't for the BBC adaptation in 1954, which brought the chilling, passionate story of Winston Smith into the living rooms of the nation. Welcome to Very British Futures, and today we are looking at one of the tent poles of British telefantasy. Producer Rudolf Cartier and writer Nigel Neal's adaptation of 1984, starring Peter Cushing, Yvonne Mitchell and Andre Morel. For years, it has been unavailable to watch legitimately, except in off-air recordings of its free repeats. But in April 2022, the BFI was finally able to release a restored version to the joy of many television enthusiasts like myself. I am delighted to be joined today by regular contributors, writers John Isles and Andrew Grines. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gareth, for asking me back. George Orwell's novel was published in 1949. Contrary to popular belief, Orwell never stated that the title was a simple inversion of the year he finished writing it, and in fact earlier drafts mentioned 1980 and 1982 as the year it was set. In fact, Orwell wrote most of the book under the title The Last Man in Europe. It was first broadcast on television by CBS in America for their Studio One anthology in 1953. The BBC followed in 1954, although they had originally optioned the book shortly after its appearance. Cartier and Neil, fresh from the success of the Coitermass experiment, were invited to adapt the book after an initial adaptation by Orwell's widow, Sonia Brownwell, and critic Kenneth Tynan was judged unworkable. The play was broadcast live as part of the Sunday Night Theatre Strand, on the 12th of December 1954 and caused enormous debate amongst viewers, critics and parliamentarians for its violence, its politics and its misanthropy. Despite some objections, a second live performance went ahead on the 16th of December, this time being telerecorded. In fact, it is one of the earliest BBC drama recordings to still exist. It has since been repeated in 1977, 1994 and 2003. Neil's script was refilmed in 1965 as part of the World of George Orwell, a trilogy within BBC Two's Theatre 625 series. It followed on from adaptations of Keep the Aspidistra Flying and Coming Up for Air. The plot of 1984 is part of modern folklore. In the future... Britain is a part of Oceania, and London has been renamed Airstrip One. Society is ruled by Ingsoc, led by Big Brother, whose face is seen constantly on posters and telescreens. Winston Smith is a party member working in the Ministry of Truth, who begins an affair with Julia, another party member, despite love between party members being a crime. He thinks he has an ally in one of his superiors, O'Brien. Inevitably, the lovers are arrested, and O'Brien reveals that he is a member of the Fort Police. O'Brien oversees Winston's torture, which leaves him a broken man who now worships Big Brother. So, turning to first to you, Andrew, I was wondering... When did you first encounter 1984 as a book and this particular television production? 
I think uh, for the book, it had to be uh, during English literature uh, when I was at high school, in which it was one of the uh, texts that we read as a group. Uh, we had to read through the book, as I remember not very clearly, but over, a, uh, over the course of an academic year and basically reflect in the class what we thought about the meaning of the book, what it meant about society and what we were supposed to try and do with the message and how we relate to the world around us more generally, more broadly. Given that that was uh, when I was first reading it, obviously at that age, you're not really going to find the sort of uh, multi-layered significances or the other messages within the text, because that's simply beyond you as a as a high school student. But we learned enough. We learned enough about the text and the message to understand that it was about basically systems of control and how those systems of control can then be identified uh, in our daily lives and the kind of ideas about individual freedom versus the versus the interests of the collective and how quite often the interests of the collective can dominate to the expense of the wishes of the individual. That was probably way deeper than we went at school. We probably digested it purely as a science fiction. But uh, that was, as I remember, my first encounter um, with the book. And um, I think we managed to finish it before we moved on to the Demon Headmaster, which personally I enjoyed at the time much, much more. But uh, there you are. <laughs> As for the Peter Cushing version, I think it will have been uh, a broadcast sometime during the uh, 90s. I'm not too sure when it was rebroadcast. I'm pretty certain I came across it when it was on. That may well be a false memory. It was 1994. 94, thank you. Yes, yeah, so up, up until that point, I'd only have seen the John Hurt there, version. So I was more familiar with that than the Peter Cushing one. And when I first saw it, my initial impression was something about... The production value is not quite being what I would have expected, but when you have to contextualise that against when it was made and how it was made and the fact that it was approached in an entirely different way to what you'd expect with a feature film, that is very much forgivable. But again, it contains important messages, important messages which I was more likely to be able to understand and digest. Uh, and of course, I was a big fan at the time of uh, Peter Cushing, still am. So uh, seeing him... Uh, in the role, I think it was one of his earlier roles, when the first was one of the defining roles, seeing him basically as the lead will provide something of a hook. I'll turn to, to, to you, John, and, and how did you first encounter both the book and uh, this particular uh, production of it? So my introduction's the opposite of Andrew's. Even though we went to the same high school, he was a couple of years behind me. They must have changed the curriculum or it was up to the, the teacher what they read. I first heard about it just from adults mentioning things like Big Brother or reading it at school when they were children. And this was the 80s, probably maybe the 80s, about 84. The first time I saw it would probably have been the John Hurt one, probably on Channel 4 in the early 90s. I don't know much about it, really. Maybe the Eurythmic songs, but that's about it. And then I, I must have heard of the TV, the 1954 version from probably TV Zone or something like that I'd read anyway. And then when found out it was being broadcast on BC2, I, I had to watch it because I had obviously an interest in classic Doctor Who and other old television. And I wanted to watch this a well-regarded role for Peter Cushing and uh, a piece of live television from the 50s, which was quite rare to see something like that. And then I probably bought the book a few years later and, and read read that then. I'm still, and I've been thinking about this question myself, and I'm not sure when I first encountered the 1984 as a novel. I mean, I think I was certainly aware of those phrase. I think I had heard that phrase, "Big Brother," yeah, quite a bit. I see. I've got a memory of parents talking about it as as a phrase, and I think they. Maybe you can interject on that one. Sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, Big Brother is such a part of popular culture and society. That I think you can be familiar with Big Brother without having to be familiar with 1984. I mean, just look at Channel 4. Yeah, it's, it's such a part of the way in which we think of control and the power of the state that you can never ever, you can get through life without ever having read 1984 or watching 1984 and still know what Big Brother is and what Big Brother means. Or hearing about 1984, people don't even know that Big Brother is from a fictional story. I think you're absolutely right, both of you. I think as a phrase, it's now, it's outlived the book, it's outgrown the book, it's mm. part of our, it's just part of the English language. Now. And yet it means something which the book would recognise, I think. 
And I'm thinking about this as this particular TV production. I have a feeling, like a lot of things, when I was younger, I probably came through it through the gateway drug of Doctor Who, I suspect. <laughs> it was probably mentioned in in other interviews or in relation to the early days of television. Yeah. And uh, and also Quatermass, because we, we had the Quatermass books at home. Mm. And I think it's referred to in the About the Author section. Mm. That's all, uh, yes. And you did, and you did oh. 1984. The, uh, the sci-fi community and the sci-fi world at large has this propensity to co-opt um, things, which are not necessarily science fiction, but it has tendencies and recognisable storytelling elements that you find in science fiction. This is one of the reasons why you see that Breaking Bad is so popular within the sci-fi community. Similarly with 1984, what? although it is not a science fiction, uh, it is within the sci-fi community. It is so interlinked with it. And that, yeah, Quatermass does represent something of a route to the wider sci-fi world, which 1984 is a fundamental part of. I mean, there is that debate. I mean, there are quite a few people who would say 1984 isn't science fiction. You know, it's, yes, it's you would say it is a literary novel or it's, and you know, they want to keep it away from being a genre book. When I bought my copy, it was in the literature section of W. H. Smith's. But it could also be described as social commentary. And oh, it if, is. And if you take away the year, forget the idea that it's set in a future Britain, it could have been set in contemporary Soviet Union, 1948. One of the reasons the book was very popular in America. Mm. Uh, he, he hadn't planned it that way, but it did <laughs> sort of chime yeah. in with that whole McCarthyism fear of of communism and so, uh, no doubt at all that anyone listening to this now will be screaming at me saying but what about the telescreens what about the technology it's quite <laughs> science fi and say so, yes i will concede that those are however they're not required to the plot which is more sort of commentary than it is science fiction you know, science fiction is about ideas and how a situation can affect humanity it's not about spaceships or flying cars and this is something that it still gets my goat you know, the whole Michael Grade thing of, oh, we cancelled Dot 2 because people expect Star Wars level effects for science fiction. No, they don't. That's what people that don't like science fiction think science fiction is the appeal. And it's not, is it? It's the ideas. I think we mm. might let the Michael Grade thing go now. Never. <laughs> it's 1984, 85. Ne it's 2022. Never. <laughs> I'm holding a grudge for, for Dot 2 and the tripods. I mean, to me, the sort of the telly screens, the television that you watch and it watches you, that's a very, to me, that's a very neat sci-fi idea, and there's a lot, there's a lot in there you can unpack. I mean, that's something that comes <laughs> through, certainly in the book, and reasonably well in most adaptions. That sense of constant surveillance that you've always got mm. to be watching how you act. And not not just what you say, it's almost, you know, any emotion has got to be. And yet really... it's not coming from, and this sounds slightly glib, but it's important, I think, to note it. It is not coming from a position of malevolence or control. Big Brother is motivated as a concerning figure to try and look after members of society and to correct them that when they go wrong. It's an attempt to try and protect the collective and the individuals that stray risk that. So from their point of view, what they're trying to do is look after you by keeping an eye on you, making sure you're okay, giving you, making sure you do your exercise, just making sure that you are all right, making sure you're well fed, you get your, you know, you get your gin or whatever it is. Um, and it takes care of you, it clothes you, it houses you, it keeps you warm. So Big Brother is a benevolent force. On their uh, right. But it's the erosion of individual liberty, which is where the malevolence comes in. And when you try to express that individuality, that's when you see the other side of Big Brother becomes the Big Brother that comes in and gives you a smack, not the Big Brother that comes and helps you out. Again, though, family contextualised. It's interesting what you say there, because the novel and consequently its adaptations are very much about language. You know, the party loves to dress itself up in this as you say, this sort of benevolent, protective kind of language, you get the Ministry of Peace is in fact the war office, and the Ministry of Love is the secret police that are crashing down on everybody. Ministry of Truth is like the newspapers. 
fiction it's television adaptive to what narrative is required to be communicated by the government which is of course completely being rewritten all the time they are rewriting history all the time so that for example the the, the nature of the enemy they're fighting that they've always been fighting but within the story that name changes mm-hmm. of the, because the war of course is never supposed to be won merely fought mm. yeah it, it's it's east asia and then four years ago it changed to eurasia uh, mm-hmm. and and also of course our main character winston smith that's his job to correct these stories so that they, they fit the current mm-hmm. the current events rather than them being showing big brother to be wrong and of course, when you change language, um, you change meaning. And as you change meaning and language, you change the ability to conceptualize ideas. And if you eradicate an idea or you destroy the very concept of an idea, then it's impossible to talk about it. It's impossible to advocate for it because mm-hmm. it no longer exists. Well, that's yeah. that's new speak, isn't it? So people will no longer have words to rebel. So you can't have a rebellion uh, if you can't organize it. And if you do have a rebellion, of course, you have to control it. In fact, that's brilliantly summed up. One of my favourite scenes in this uh, adaptation is with Donald Pleasance as Symes, and he's explaining how brilliant Newspeak is to yeah. uh, to Winston Smith. And he say, "Isn't it brilliant? We're the only language that gets smaller year on year." And you know, and, they, and he says exactly what you said that soon it won't be possible to rebel because there won't be that language. There won't, and without the language, there won't be the fort to rebel. He no. believes. So in this, is whole bunch of this double good, double plus good. Exactly, he says we don't need the word bad anymore. Mm. So, so that's where you get your good and double plus good from, and the word freedom will be gone, and so f- slavery. You know, there is nowhere. That's the idea that the part being a party just wants complete control, apart from mm. the proles, of course. I do. I'm very pleased that, that Neil, you know, chose to keep that scene in. That leads me on to Nigel Neil, and what do you think about his adaptation of the novel and the choices that he makes in taking a novel and putting it into under two hours for what was still quite a primitive BBC television department drama department of course as i believe that some of the uh, of the um adaptation it, it, part of it was filmed wasn't it of course mm. uh, so it was too complicated to do all live that was something that rudolf cartier really brought in because uh, uh, at a time when a lot of other directors would use those film inserts as, as just for scene setting basically mm-hmm. and uh, really just as almost space markers whilst the actors were moving around from set to set. But uh, Rudolf Cartier really makes a virtue of that, and he uses those film inserts to keep on telling the story and make it bigger. Isn't all of the the torture in Room 101, that's all on film? Yes, that was one. In fact, that was one of the first things to be filmed, actually. Oh, yeah, the bit with um, Winston Smith at the mirror when he's broken. But you could argue that this uh, this method of um, television production was therefore groundbreaking and um, helped with the general growth of television as a medium um, in the uh, post-war period. But certainly as well, we have to remember that television audiences were very low at the time, it was still growing. So reputation and how things were reported afterwards remained a fundamental part of how you gained that recognition. So well, people yeah. learning about this uh, play, hearing what it would be like, may well have gone out and bought the book. And then read the book rather than watch the mm. play. I've just been on. Yes, but it's true. I think it is sort of documented. There was a sales did markedly increase for 1984 mm. following this transmission. So yeah, I, I I think definitely this BBC production did help move the novel from out of the if it were academia and the sort of in, literary intellectual sort of mm. circles and kind of put it with the uh, the man in the street. And thereby doing so, becoming known as a sci-fi rather than as a social commentary. That's not a bad thing. Marketing it as a science fiction thing which will appeal to a mass audience is a good thing because it gets it to a wider readership and they can pick up on the social commentary as well. But the point being, it was a groundbreaking uh, production, uh, obviously as well informed by his work on Quatermass and later Quatermass 2, 
uh, sort of helped to develop his uh, personal profile and reputation and filming techniques, which we did bring to it, which inevitably will have had an impact upon the quality of the production and making it memorable. Uh, I mean, you both read the novel. I, I'm I'm currently in the uh, process of reading the novel. I'll admit, actually, I haven't quite got to the end of it in time for the podcast. Is is it your first time reading it? It is actually my first time reading it. I'm quite impressed. It is a very readable novel. I it think. is, isn't it? It's very easy to read, despite the bleak tone and mm. and, the, and the sense of hope that you get from Winston. But like the introduction, which is on the BFI disc, is from Michael Barry, who was the head of BBC Drama, saying mm-hmm. it, it, it's a bleak play that you're about to watch. He's right. It's a bleak novel. George Orwell did intend it as a as a warning, didn't he, to say this is what could happen if yeah. if if socialism gets out of control or communism mm. i think he was actually aiming a bit wider than just com- socialism and communism that's kind of i think he was all kind of tyranny from across the spectrum he was yeah. sort of like saying this is what it looks like this is what it does yeah yeah i i, f- I find it interesting though that you know like winston and julia speculate how long they've got before they get caught you know, they're just kind of living the moment as long as they can. And they don't know who they can trust, who else might have dissident thoughts. And, mm. you know, uh, it happens to his neighbour Parsons, his, his own children turn him in, you know, mm. and, and he is a loyal party member. It just mm. shows that anybody, you, you know, that's it, you can be unpersoned or, or whatever. Uh, and, and it's like, what is the point? You, you know, there's... There's no hope for, for Winston or Julia. But I think that is but, a point. I think but it's is, still an enjoyable book, if, if that makes that, sense. If uh, you know there's no escape, and if you know you're going to get caught, and the, there's absolutely nothing that you can do to prevent that from happening, you've already crossed those lines, then you might as well enjoy what time you've got with your partner or others uh, until that happens. Because you're going to get... if you. If you've been rebellious and then you suddenly become loyal, you're still going to get caught. I, I think in some ways the TV adaption actually makes it grimmer, I think, by visualising <laughs> it in some way. Because yeah. the, the book has moments of humour. Uh, well, in the way there are descriptions of things. There is a certain... People black, and, and yeah. stuff, yeah. And whereas that is largely missing, I think, and I think deliberately from the BBC version of it, or at least what is there, could be, you can slightly pick up, particularly, as you mentioned, Parsons, which yeah. is, uh, who is played by Campbell Gray. Basically, he's the ultimate party party guy. He's uh, <laughs> the joiner in at all at all things. Exactly. And he's, he's, he's very keen on, he, he absolutely has swallowed everything the party has given him. And he utterly believes and he's terribly cheerful and uh, he's a busybody. And he's, yeah. a, he's quite, in some ways, quite a funny sort of grotesque yes. character. And even at the but end, when, like I say... Why would you reverse everything that the benevolent force gives you if you don't know any different, if that's all you've ever known? Mm, the, and even at the end, even as you say, his children turn him in to the because authorities. Correct and for his own good. And, he, and he's like, oh, I'm so proud of them, even yeah. as he's kind of being beaten up. And yes. so like that. he's like, I'm so proud. <laughs> Little tykes, so like they're, oh, they're, 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 they're so good. And I, I must say, his monstrous children, that is, uh, and it's an interesting actual thing, because in the book, it's an older boy and a younger girl, yeah. and they swap that around. And I think it e- has even more impact that it's a girl coming yeah. out with all the party propaganda and she's even her mother she's kind of ter- you know she's bullying her mother terribly and oh yeah talking about oh we want to kill spies i you know i can you know the thing that they, they can't wait to sort of like have a <laughs> just they'll, they'll go off that night and uh have, have a hanging somewhere so there is a little bit of humor dark humor in that so there were two things about that scene i wanted to mention actually the mm-hmm. one where Mrs. Parsons asked Winston to come and help unblock her, her kitchen sink. The, uh, the the girl playing the daughter, uh, mm-hmm. she was nineteen and had a and had a career of playing children. Oh, uh, that was something I learned from the very informative audio commentary from the BFI release. Oh. Uh, 
and uh, she'd, she'd get sort of funny looks and whatever because like most adults then everybody smoked uh, and another thing is like you said they reversed it the the girl being the eldest and being the most outspoken uh, you were talking about the adaptation aspect from Nigel Neal when when the boy's reading out his history book about the capitalists and and, and how they they ruled over everybody uh, Winston borrows that book in the novel from from the boy mm. and so the stuff that, that the boy reads out in the tv version Winston reads out or remembers in his head to us as the reader that's a good example of how to make it a bit more conversational yeah you know, because I mean it's because the book is largely it's all an internal monologue mostly of, of Winston's as he's yeah. going around we, we have the voiceovers as well and get to see the values of the world the people that live in it we, we get some parts of the book from Winston's thoughts, don't we, his uh, voiceovers. Considering the performances, um, I was wondering, Andrew, what you what you uh, think of the P- Peter Cushing and Yvonne Mitchell's performances? Well, I'm a complete novice when it comes to this kind of thing, but I would say that their performances are, as you'd expect me to see, say, you know, um, really, really, really spot on. I think that they've interpreted the characters in their own way, given it was live, there was always going to be that certain sense of spontaneity about it, that sort of realism element. But in the way in which they conveyed the messages, the way in which they ensured that the correct kind of dialogues were hit in the right places, I think the performances were very good. I, I, I agree with you. I think it, uh, they're both, and they are, because they go on this quite journey from being, and they do this lovely boing in the, yeah. in the first half. They, are, they start off, they're these very controlled guarded people and then they sort of they come alive yeah, in kind this of romance of the control for so the, the part of the fundamental message there is that even the most controlled human at the end of the day is still a human so if you strip away the source of that control then normal human emotions will still emerge uh, big brother's contention uh, if it was a conscious thought uh, would be that, no, if you strip away that authoritarian control, what you're left with is a husk. I mean, like you say, it's it, there's a sort of the season the moment, even though they know they're, they're doomed. I mean, because we get this whole thing, or Brian says, you know, he kind of mocks, you know, during the torture scenes, he's sort of mocking the whole narrative that some sort of love will will save them. And you know, he says, no, no, there's not. And it doesn't really exist. There's only at the end of the day there, there's a I think it's a lovely line. It's sort of like there is no love except for love of love of Big Brother, and then so, there's only power. Only power remains at the end as yeah. a as a desire. And I think what disturbed people at the time and still does is that certainly in the adaptations, in all the adaptations really, that on film and radio and TV and radio is that there is no hope by the end it it's it is an utterly it ends seemingly with the victory of the party and o'brien's philosophy mm-hmm. it seems to just well this is the fundamental orwellian critique of communism or all authoritarian control in general which is that basically once you're under it you're under it uh, this is a familiar uh, message that you gave us in Animal Farm as well, in which when the pig, pigs take over, they stay in control. So there is no victory in that kind of system because it's too big, it's too oppressive to be able to take down in a conventional way. No amount of protesting or anything like that is going to make any difference um, because the system is just too strong. So it's that's part of the warning of once you've let this happen, you're, you're stuck with it. The only way out is either death or run away. And uh, John, I think why thoughts about uh, as O'Brien uh, of of um, Andrew Morell? Uh, I think he's probably the the best performance in that. Mm. I mean, Cushing is always reliable, no matter what he's in. You know, the amount of rubbish films he's done over the years. <laughs> uh, Andrew Morell. In fact, I'm still not sure when when O'Brien is torturing uh, Winston. And uh, when he's, he, is he being genuine that he has concern or is it that pretend concern of Big Brother? Uh, I think he plays it really well, but it's believable that, first of all, he is a dissenter. And then when mm-hmm. it turns out he's not, 
you know, he's he's torturing Winston for his own good. Is he doing it out of genuine concern, or or is it just the party line? I find that really interesting that he comes across well in both roles. He does. He, mm, there is he, that fight. And 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 also with we were saying about that torture sequence being all on film. There's a lot of close-ups of of him because we're we're, we're being held back to see what's happened to Winston. So it's all on Andre Morel in close-up, which is quite unusual for television. Mm. And, and he just holds it so well. Mm, he has real presence, definitely, as an actor. It's, and it's interesting to see him in a role like this, it's, uh, because he's generally, he, he sort of plays quite clubbable gentlemen in, yeah. sort of, in a lot of sort of period drama. So it's it's interesting to see him in a more sort of this kind of more sinister role, uh, the less less of um killer. I think it was casting against type, somebody that you could trust mm. is what O'Brien's supposed to be. I get sense I mean to me is in those speeches he gives in torture, I think he is sincere. Uh, uh, to me at any rate. I think he he believes what he's saying, although admittedly, some of it is for effect. Mm. If you know, there's you know, if, if you are the last human, that is humanity, and 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 you're looking at Winston, who's all sort of like starving and ragged. ragged. Oh yeah, and a bit about imagining the future. It's like uh, if you want a picture of the future, imagine a boot stamping on a human face forever. I don't think he says that to be cruel. I think he's just saying that as a matter of fact. Mm. That, that's what the party wants. What he means by human, because he and the party and all the loyal subjects are not the definition of human, which he is using there. I think there are humans and there are humans. He's referring to the individualistic capitalist. So I think that's what he's talking about, rather than talking about the human that is a loyal member of society and a loyal follower of Big Brother. Of course, he means the human spirit, which the party wants to be rid of because they're just after power and control. Which they would define as individualism. Of course. One mm. one thing I wanted to mention, obviously the, the proles aren't a threat and aren't considered human even. You know, they're controlled mm. through porn and false lotteries and stuff. They it's, will have different it, sources of control. It, it is bizarre how the parallels just seem to fit any present day that, that mm. the view of all listener fits into. It, it's it's bizarre. I, I don't think it is prophecy, but it's just... A startling coincidence that hasn't gone away. I, I feel that with the you've got the outer party, Winston and Julia are in. Now, are they the middle classes? Is that what happened to work? Because obviously the working classes are the proles. So anyone that's mm. middle class or descended has become the outer party, and then they work their way up. Or maybe the capitalists became, or at least the leaders of the revolution yeah. became the inner party. I, I don't think it's as new as no. the class. I mean, there was like the, the party. And there is some sort of inner party, apparently. Exactly, yeah, like O'Brien, uh, who knows everything, the truth about Big Brother mm. doesn't exist, the fact Goldstein's made up mm. and all that. You, you know, I just wonder what your take is, because we're not told that, we don't need to know that, but I wondered what, what you two thought. Mm. Andrew, what, what, what do you think about the, sort of the, the way the society's organised and the pros? Well, I've always sort of viewed what we see or, or read as the equivalent of Whitehall, that this is the various departments and ministries in London interacting with each other. And the people live inside the departments like they, like, uh, well, yeah, like what some people do. So what we see very much the heart of the government. And when they go outside, we see the country, the people, um, the Poles, who have no say whatsoever in how that government functions and the kind of way in which it runs society. Mm. It's basically an unperson. So the real people of Britain in this context have no relationship with inverted commas Whitehall because it's an entirely different operation, entirely different world. But there's no way that the people can replace that because it's too strong. And there will be, if, if we are going to go down the kind of sci-fi route, <laughs> there will be other systems of control on the poles that we don't know about, that we didn't see. There were mm. there were these drugs at play, as we saw in other sci-fi, such as Blake 7 which prevents the majority of the population from realising their position. So we, or, or indeed there may be other kinds of televisual um, entertainments, for lack of a better word, that keep them distracted. 
That will prevent oh, yeah. the from, from organising and taking down Whitehall or whatever they call it in London. Um, but it is a different, it is not representative of the rest of the country. It is how the country is governed. Um, so that's how I've seen it because it's not really relevant to the work story no. which Orwell wanted to tell. No, uh, Oceania is part of America. Uh, and that's mm. why they've got US money and stuff. But like you said, it's all set in London or, or Airstrip 1. Mm. I wonder if that was a commentary on America taking over everything. Yeah, well, I think there's a sense that America isn't in control either. I do apologize. I, I looked this up, but it's gone out of my head. That, yeah. Uh, it, that America itself has been conquered. Okay, speaking of Big Brother, did you know that the guy, the face of Big Brother was the designer Roy Oxley who yes. worked on this yes. it was um oh. they, they, they took photos of him with and without a mustache because he didn't have one in real life yes, in fact the uh, yes yeah, in, fact, in fact Andrew might know this what? that uh, the Doctor Who story Inferno set in a fascist Britain oh, in yeah. parallel earth scenes the face of, of their leader on post and everything was the designer of Inferno mm -hmm. in homage to Roy Oxley doing it on 1984. I, I didn't know oh. it was in charge. I knew that it was, but I didn't know that was the reason. I thought it was there as a game, as a joke, as it was oh. in 1984. Well, that's same kind of thing. I realized it was a direct homage to the yeah. state production. Wow, that's good. No, I did not know that. That's, that's very interesting. Oceana, and I'm quoting here from Wikipedia. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the source of knowledge, well done. Thank you. Hey, <laughs> Is that the Oceania was formed after the United States merged with the British Empire? The state composes of the Americas, the Atlantic Islands, Australasia, and the southern portion of Africa. I think another actor I'd just like to mention, Ron, that is uh, Wilfred Bramble, called better yes. known as uh, Albert Stepto. Oh, this um, is pre, this the, pre Stepto, is isn't it? This was the play which typecast him forever. As an old doddering man, despite the fact that he was <laughs> young, it, well, it's on in. He only ever played old men. That's interesting, and I'll, yeah, it could that could be. It's interesting that even though they've got quite a big cast, he does actually double up in two yeah. roles. Yeah, uh, saves money. I mean, his old man character is definitely in the book, and that whole scene mm. is done pretty similar to the book. It's a good or, scene. Although it's interesting that he, in the next, in Quatermass 2, he comes back oh, does playing he? quite a similar, he's in, he has a very similar part as an old man who, quite a, who kind of reminiscing about the past. And I, uh, I, I need to rewatch that. In uh, Steptoe and Son as an old man. Mm. Uh, but of course, if you've got an old man as a main character in something like Steptoe mm. and Son, you're going to want a youngish actor to play them. It's like what they did with Last of Summer Wine with the actress that played Pearl actually mm -hmm. quite young. Oh. They have to do things like run around. They have to do things like climb things and fall off them. So mm -hmm. you don't want an actual old man in that role. They cast younger people, and that's what basically happened to Wilfred Bramble. He, he got some 1984, Quatermass, <laughs> and a few other things. Yep, he got typecast and never played a young character again. He, he was Paul's granddad in A Hard Day's Night, wasn't he? He's yes. very good in that. It's a very good film, that one. It's interesting, his other role as the Finn prisoner. Yeah, I thought that was yes, a great so. credit. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good little scene. And that's interesting because it probably he's playing a bit younger in that bit and he's more using his own voice because yeah. he was very well spoken. In, he was a well, you know, a classically yeah. trained, well spoken actor. Donald Pleasance as a sign in, in this production. Uh, went on to play Parsons in the 1956 film adaptation. Uh, I've seen bits of him as Parsons. He is very good. He's he's not quite as swarthy as as the as the BBC version or of Donald Pleasance, but you know he plays it slightly slightly funny still. It's a bit worrying that somebody would go. Um, I just played a character in a disturbing horror film with lots of violence. I want to do it again. Mm -hmm. That's in need of the money. I'm going to follow opportunities on every opportunity to play that character or any variation of that mm. character again for the rest of my career. Yeah, it's a bit of a worry. Well, it's interesting you say that because apparently both Peter Cushing and Yvonne Mitchell said that the script gave them nightmares oh, for a little while. 
the 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 cast um in the um on the also on the BFI disc is an excerpt from the late night lineup show on BC2 from 1965 where they've reunited interview Peter Cushing, Yvonne Mitchell, Andre Morel, Rudolf Cartier and um, Nigel Neal to reminisce about something they made 11 years ago. They, they, they say that the whole cast got depressed during rehearsals because mm. the script was so so doom laden. Well, it's horrible. It's not actually an enjoyable book. Or an, well, you know what I mean? It's not, yeah, it's not enjoyable in those terms. Play of any other incarnation, it's not, it's not, it doesn't leave you feeling good at the end of it. It leaves you feeling horrible. God knows why they made us read it at school. It doesn't give you any kind of excuses or ways out. It's really. not Star Trek, which shows you a <laughs> positive view of the future, which you want to aspire to. It's, it's a warning. The version of the future that you want to run away from. It also, I think, comes down to what you do with the information. Because um, what Big Brother was doing with the information in uh, in the book and uh, TV series was using it to maintain behaviours and maintain loyalty amongst the population. Yeah. What we do with that kind of information in our so-called Big Brother society is we use it to sell stuff. That's <laughs> true. Uh, I, accept, I accept cookies. <laughs> it's, yes, we are being watched. We're being, we're being watched, though, to see if we can be sell, uh, sold better products. Which is good it. argue is a different kind of dystopia. It's still a dystopia, but it's Facebook, not used by government. Facebook ads, it, whatever conversation you have around your devices, you'll find adverts appearing on your Facebook or on mm. web pages you view. Yeah. So the very thing you've been talking about. It no, should be no, people that wants to sell to you. Yeah, mm. in some ways you could say perhaps our society has moved more towards that other great British dystopia novel brave new world we've kind of gone more into that way with the control through hedonism and oversaturization which its author aldous huxley ironic who was who who knew george orwell george orwell sent him an early copy of 1984 oh. and uh, and huxley said he was actually a little bit patronising. Orwell had been a, a pupil of his. In his letter, he said, uh, well, it's a good book, but I think you'll find I covered all this in my novel, uh, <laughs> Brave New World. And he, he, did, uh, he was of the opinion that that was the thing that was unrealistic. He felt it's more realistic that governments will rule through bread and circuses rather than ultra repression. But they are kind of talked about in the same breath aren't they brave new world and 1984 uh, as being these classic science fiction novels mm -hmm. commenting does, on future they're society they're, they're kind of bedfellows uh -huh. and lumped together aren't they interesting other question which you you know which i think needs to be asked needs to be addressed and uh, since i've got you both hostage here i might as well throw it at you <laughs> Which is, yes, this is a warning, and yes, Brave New World is a warning, but why does the warning need issue in the first place? So I would suggest it needs issue because people are susceptible to the idea of being controlled. They like mm. the idea of an all-powerful figure because it makes them feel safe. And that's also why Big Brother uses the language of safety, of mm. love, of control, but control for your own good, doing you a favour here. He's helping you. It's, again, all because of the human condition, why it's not a science fiction. Because of the confusion uh, that John has in the science fiction analogies, it loses the social point of it being about the human condition and about our desire to constantly be told what we should do. That's the role filled by Big Brother. Science fiction is about the human condition. Take uh, Duane Doyle's Dream of Electric Sheep or Blade Runner. That's about what it means to be human. You know, are the, are the androids human because yeah, they have well, emotions, they have the flesh bodies? I'm talking about 1984. I know, I'm just saying, though, that, you okay. know, I, I'm, I'm not arguing that 1984 is science fiction or not, but it just uses some of the tools of science fiction just to show what society is like under a certain condition. We'll move on a little bit in the yeah, we'll can you think on. of yeah, can you think of influences of nineteen eighty-four? Uh, we've already said this is quite a groundbreaking influential production in terms of how it was made and what it could cover. I think it was a good marker for the BBC to say we can do drama that's political and fairly modern at a time when most of its output was sort of 
classic plays and adaptions of famous novels of the past. I think it was really at the time when the BBC was sort of trying to figure out what it was for. Um, was it there just to report the facts that periodically around the day uh, and provide the occasional coverage with music? Or is it there to provide more, as a, not just a public service, but to also entertain? And this, you can sort of see this in the TV schedules uh, over the period of before the war, during the war and after the war, in which the BBC brought, started broadcasting more and more. Because if you look at the TV listings in the late 40s, you'll see that it broadcasts primarily only within very few hours of the day, even on television. And as we enter the 50s and make our way across the 50s, it started to broadcast more material. But when you get to that point, you need more material to broadcast. It means they have to break out of that constraining belt of where it came from in the 20s and 30s of just broadcasting the news and music and start to create content. And I think this was part of that shift in argument about what the BBC was for, about it was growth, about it to be both public service, but also something which you could turn to for entertainment and education, and also thinking and political debates. But audience numbers at this point were still low, of course, but they were growing, the trajectory was upwards, so its reach was low. But by the, by the time you get to the 60s, that was going through the roof. So I think, yeah, 1984 as a production, fits into that kind of growing place for the BBC and society. And so we are not really all that surprised to see it and see more and uh, watch it grow even further. I hope that even vaguely answers your question. That's a very interesting answer. I was going to ask John, would you like to comment a bit more on the, um, the response to 1984 at the time in the well, newspapers? Like Orson Welles' 1938 radio broadcast of War of the Worlds, that there is some some myth and truth to the public outrage. Uh, it seems to be generally that because the play was broadcast twice, uh, so the Sunday evening play went out live, uh, and I think it was a Thursday or Friday repeat, which was a second live performance, which they recorded, uh, tele recorded, which we now have, thankfully, but. It was a case of people outraged saying, oh, you know, how, how dare you? In fact, in that um, late night lineup, they, they show us some of the letters. So just like points of view, we have letters reading out. Uh, it's things like saying, I do not think anyone could argue that the play was obscene to a degree and quite unsuitable for the vast audience to which it was playing. Some of the topics discussed were quite revolting to any decent person. And certainly struck at the root of everything a respectable school tries to teach. Now, I think that letter was from a head teacher, but then mm -hmm. the ones in support of it is there's a supporting one here. It says, Please repeat 1984. No doubt some have forgotten Belson. So, so, um, so, so, so there was the support, and all the newspaper reviewers kind of had negative headlines but wrote positively. The, the Daily Worker, uh, a socialist newspaper, was on the the one that was actually against the production and said because of the English socialism bit, it made them look bad. <laughs> well, I think we're coming, we're drawing to the close. I have some bits of trivia that I, I didn't get to mention. No one's <laughs> well, the, the look and influence of the Ministry of Truth where, where Winston works with the, the speak rights and stuff is, is echoed in the film Brazil. Jonathan Bryce's character works in a ministry that looks very much like that kind of oppressive feel. Um, mm, um, I think... uh, and uh, uh, I was going to say, the benevolent face on the video screen was in the Doctor Who story Time Lash with the Borad, the kindly old man appearing on the video screen. I would say that if you can judge a programme's impact, um, that it can be measured in the way in which it is mocked, in the way in which it is sat satirised or even have the uh, the piss taken out of it. When you think of something like 1984 and its broadcast, it tends not to be something which you expect to see mocked. And yet, The Goon Show uh, presented a parody very shortly afterwards in which they did exactly that. And the source of their mockery was the BBC. Uh, I think it's definitely attacking itself, in that, but I think it illustrates the impact of the original that if you can find yourself as, as a source of comedy only shortly afterwards, then it goes to show just how much of a significant impact that you have made upon society. Can I have some final thoughts 
particularly about this BBC production of 1984. Oh yeah, I suppose we should talk about that. Enjoyed this one. I, I saw it in '94. I I, re- I videoed it for those old enough to remember those times, and I had watched it multiple times in the past, uh, and now I, it's great being able to rewatch it on shiny disc. And I think even without Peter Cushing or Romel, it's just a really good thought piece uh, mm. of like what could happen if the, the control of will or somebody in charge takes away that because it is. As we said earlier, it's a futility. There is no individualism. You know, the inner party wants to get rid of all, all feelings of, of familial connection or sexuality because then everyone's loyal to the party and big brother and the proles can just do, just do all the manufacturing and, and coal mining and stuff. They don't matter. So it, it's really interesting and enjoyable despite the grim subject. And, and, and it's just really clever and just shows what, you know, Oh yeah, that's all. Look at the prim- laugh at the primitive live fifties TV. It's not though. Mm. There's one scene where there's a shadow of a boom mic. There's a couple of times where actors look like they may be about to fluff a line, but don't. They cover it very well, and it wasn't like they didn't rehearse it. Uh, and there's some very good performances, some great editing on the film sequences. It's a very good production. And if it wasn't for the fact that it's black and white. And may seem a bit slow. It should still appeal to mo- still appeal to modern audiences. I think I can agree with a lot of that. I think uh, Nigel Neal does a very good job at filleting the message of the book and putting it into a TV script. I mean, he spent a lot of his career at adapting, and this is one of his best adaptations. Uh, Andrew, would you like to have some uh, feelings about it? Well, I always like to think about legacy and what I like to think about uh, how something remains significant. And the fact that it's recently been released on uh, Blu-ray says that it still has an audience, it still has an interest, it still has a capacity to communicate its message to new generations of viewers. It has got basically a part, an ongoing part in uh, society uh, because there's still a lot of um, relevant themes and stories, elements to it, which speak to us in 2022 and set to be still with us for very many years into the future. Uh, Before we wrap up, you are both busy people with lots of projects. And I would love to know, uh, what what are you uh, up to at the moment? Uh, Well, at the moment, I'm getting together with my scientific notes and I'm almost managing to create a human. But I just (laughs) need to get the right level of electricity from the lightning before it will activate. (laughs) <laughs> At the moment, I'm uh, currently working on a new project, uh, hopefully which will turn into a book, looking at the leadership and longevity of Boris Johnson in the crisis uh, situations and uh, that he's found himself in, uh, and how this invariably is linked to his persona and his character as defined by the classical works of ancient Greece, namely people like Quintilian and Aristotle. It's at the early stages at the moment, but hopefully it will materialise into some kind of formal monograph within the next two to three years. And hopefully that book will be out to purchase in about two to three years, hopefully a good price, although my last one did cost about £140, so you might want to get a library to buy it. It's all fun. I'm spending my time researching and writing about the lockdown, so I'm never going to get out of this dystopia. (laughs) Uh, How about yourself, John? I've just finished doing a podcast series with my friends Rebecca Ray and Danny Ray uh, called Tripods Cast, which looks at the books, television, video game and other adaptations of the novels by John Christopher, a.k.a. Sam Mude. The 10 part series available on Spotify. Uh, it will be coming to Apple Podcasts sometime now-ish, soon. Uh, we, 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 we cover the whole range and we even had our final episode, which coincided with the centenary of Sam Ude's birth, where we discussed his other non-sci-fi books. Uh, he wrote he wrote romantic fiction. He wrote uh, other dystopian novels. He wrote literature. He wrote crime. He wrote cricket novels. He wrote adult novels, uh, all under various different names, but. His uh, two of his children, Nick and Rose, you'd set up um, the Sile Press 
Samuel Literary Estate to print his books that, that they had the, the rights to still that were out of print to, to bring his work back into the public domain. So it, it's been good to be part of that. And our soon to be follow up series called I Don't Do Sci-Fi, because Danny is notoriously not a sci-fi fan like like the rest of the team. Uh, and so we're going to be subjecting her to to watching or listening to other pro properties, uh, the first of which will be appearing later this year, we hope. And we're going to be starting with uh, Star Cops with a special guest joining us not too far from home. You very and, kindly invited me on as a special guest, so thank you very much. Uh, and, and so you can find us on Twitter as at TripodsCast. That's with an S in the middle, because we found there was one called Tripodcast about technology, which was in German, but their lawyers have not been in touch. And we're also on Instagram under the same name. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you very much to Andrew Crines and John Isles for joining me here today. Hopefully, we'll all be together again soon. Goodbye for now. Very British Futures was hosted and produced by Gareth Preston and featured guests Andrew Scott Crines and John Isles. Music was by Chattery Art. More of Chattery's music can be heard at chattryart.bandcamp.com If you have any thoughts, questions or suggestions of what you'd like to see covered in a future episode, you can email very British Futures Podcast at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter at Futures Very. Visit our webpage, westlakefilms.uk stroke Very British Futures. You'll find a link in the podcast description. Find us on Facebook. Or visit our bookshop page for related titles, including 1984, at uk.bookshop.org stroke shop stroke very British futures.